And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Elle, who during her near-death experience went to outer space and another planet, which we're going to learn about today and more. Elle, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Can we start on the day that your NDE happened and go from there? Sure. I actually don't know what specific day the NDE happened, but I was told that the weekend of September 26, 2015, uh, my prognosis was less than 1% chance of survival. They had uh, shaved my head to check for uh, brain activity. And my family was told that I was not going to survive. So everybody started flying in and, you know, people were showing up to say goodbye. And I was given my last rites then. What brought you to the hospital in the first place? I had an infection um, and was being treated for it. I started feeling better. And then a mistake happened and then I my oxygen started to crash and basically it it was kind of like having an anaphylactic response and my body never quite bounced back they weren't able to stabilize my breathing and in order to take some pressure off of my um, body I was put on a ventilator so and then things kind of got worse from there after a while I only remember up to a specific point where I was, I don't even remember being told that I was going to be put on a ventilator. So, yeah. So maybe the last thing you remember was dozing off to sleep. And then the That's next thing. That's a really good question. <laughs> and then the next I, thing, you're in another planet or something? Well, it's kind of strange because the last thing that I remember was seeing a nurse and somebody else coming in. And then after that, it was like my life continued in a coma, but it was a different, the the experiences were different, but I didn't know that there was a transition. You know what I mean? So I started to have these experiences in coma up until You know, there were, I think there were two or three times that I was starting to, you know, there I was, they were told that I was going to to die besides that weekend. So I was close to the precipice and there were, I don't know if I can explain it properly, but what's happening on my end of things is that I have three guides that appear, okay, and they're audible voices. And they're taking me through a series of events and kind of telling me um, answers to my questions, because I always wanted to know certain things about the world, certain things about why was this the way it was or whatever. And even before this, I always said, if I were ever to die, that's the first thing I'd want to do is ask God, you know, what's going on with this? What's going on with that? Why does, why are things this way? And so I was kind of being shown that and also being shown different things about my life. And uh, so, but it, it's, it's kind of strange, but it's like on the other side, it seems normal. Like you don't, you don't think about, oh, wait a minute, I have to go to work tomorrow or, you know what I mean? Anything like that. So it's just kind of, um, it was a strange transition. When things got a little further along, uh, close to um, my death days, that's when I traveled. So I did like a lot of -of out-of-body experiences while I was in the coma until I was about to leave. So that's kind of how it it went. Would you say you were in some type of coma reality, like your body was there paralyzed? but you were conscious and awake and aware of everything that was going on? I traveled a lot out of my body. And I even, there was the procedure that was being done on me. And I was in the room and I saw them talking about me and saying what, you know, a horrible state I was in and, you know, trying to figure some things out and trying and talking about my situation. And I was, I, I didn't see my body. 
you know, it was more like a, like just my eyes, but not really like there's no body. And I was just, and I was saying, I'm right here, you know, I'm right here. And it still didn't register to me that I was, there was something seriously wrong. Like, you know, and that's why they weren't, they were talking like this. So it was, uh, I did see in, you know, people talking. What viewpoint were you seeing them from? The eyes of your own body or from outside of your body? I was outside of my body, but I, outside of my body, like there was no body. I could see, I couldn't feel my eyes. I couldn't feel any part of my body. Mm -hmm. And I was up like I was floating. So, and then looking down. So, and you're looking down at them. Mm -hmm. And did you also see your body laying in the bed? That one wasn't in the bed. That was in a, some type of room where they were doing a procedure. Mm -hmm. So it was, um, so I was there and then I was, but I don't know why it didn't register. I, I, I mean, I think I, logically somebody would think, oh, something must be wrong. There's me down there, you mm -hmm. know, but. For some reason, it's like your whole state of mind changes, you know? Uh -huh. I mean, I think sometimes near-death experiencers will see their body down there, but they won't recognize their body. They'll be like, yeah. oh, and there's some person there. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So when these guides came to you, you only mm -hmm. heard their voices. You didn't see right. them? And they had different, they were very distinctly different. For example... There was one that looked like my daughter that was mostly quiet and was just there. And then I was told that that one, you know, he, she, whoever, but looking like my daughter was anchoring me basically to try to stay alive, you know, mm -hmm. um, because a lot of the things that the feeling that you get when you're out of your body or you're connecting with a divine god and divine place is that the earth sucks basically you don't really you don't want to be here and mm -hmm. your your feelings become kind of non-human in a way kind of detached like sure i'll stay or uh, you know or i really want to stay or no i'm ready to you know to go or you know there's there's more of an objective you have more objective feelings you know so I didn't have necessarily a sense of, oh my gosh, I, you know, my daughter, this and that and the other. I just knew my daughter was there, but she was providing like her, that spirit um, who appeared as her provided comfort and an anchor while I was going through this. In between leaving your body and going places with your guides, would you come mm -hmm. back to your body and then sometimes just be kind of laying there and aware of what's going on in the room and all the people around you? Yes. Um, that's, uh, you must have had other people tell you that because that's exactly what happened. So um, I, there were times where, like I had, you know, some, um, I, I belonged to this church um, before and I, a bunch of them came and they were singing around me. I'm telling you this after the fact, basically. Mm -hmm. So it was after the fact knowledge. But that was one of the times that I remember hearing them. Um, and I would go kind of like visiting in and out of my body. Um, I was going to different places. I went to the room. And then one of the guides um, would constantly say to me, merge with this or merge with that. And the things that I would merge with are like, um, I was told to merge with um, a tree. And I was told to merge with a lily. So then I was actually in the lily and I was floating like a lily and had lily perspective and feelings like non-human. So what I was being taught and what they were trying to show me was how everything that is alive is conscious and giving me perspective of, so instead of saying to me, these guys, instead of saying to me, oh, this is how this is in the world, and this is why this is, they just showed me by putting me there. You had three guides. One was like your daughter. You had this one. Who was the third guide? The third one was showing me different things in the world and 
some of the things were uncomfortable and some of the things were um, were just what's going to happen in the future. For example, I was shown problems on issues in the world by this particular guide. Um, there's trafficking in some Asian countries. There was another place where there was organ har um, harvesting. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know about organ har harvesting, you know, um, before then. And then, you know, so they were showing me a bunch of issues. There was something having to do with Hollywood. So um, that guy kind of, be, and it's because I asked, you know, why certain things happen the way that they do. And why is this world the way that it is? So, yeah. So what was that guide's response? And what I mean is, what was his point like? Why does, why does the earth suck? <laughs> um, basically, in general, the message that I got was that we are on a journey of transition. A lot of people think that we're going towards a dystopian future. We're actually in dystopia now, and we're trying to transition into a more enlightened future. So it's actually backwards. So there's a lot of, you know, history that, you know, is not taught in schools, things that have taken place or whatever over time that kind of created the world that we're in. And we as souls are on a journey to bring ourselves to enlightenment and overcome a lot of the darkness that's around us. Regardless of the darkness, we still have a responsibility to be light because our initial, our, our true body forms are light bodies, not skin, not race, nothing like that. We're light bodies. And so all of the experiences that we're going through are to help us to get back to that state ultimately when we do go back after one, two, 50, a thousand lives, whatever it takes, basically. So are you saying that we're doing this on an individual or a collective basis? We're doing this like mushrooms. And what I mean by that, each mushroom is individual and has individual spores, but they have a mycelial network that connects them and helps them to collectively flourish. So that's, we're like a mycelial network where we have individuality and individual responsibility, but we're connected with each other and our journeys affect each other's journey. Can you share with us some of the untaught things in our past that you learned? Some of them are a bit controversial. <laughs> For example, and I know a lot of people won't accept this, but we are actually seated by another race, by other races. So we are not, you know, the story of creation is true in metaphor, but there are parts of it that are not really expressed. And we ourselves are extraterrestrials of varying different degrees. And we were seed, this planet was seeded from outer space. I think that's kind of common in s some scientific circles that they call that panspermia, okay. where basically we had this melting pot of chemicals and then seeds of life landed mm -hmm. here and things developed from there. But do you think that they took some type of primitive human and then modified it into what we are today? Or are we just completely from another planet and brought here? Our DNA is completely from another planet and brought here. So I, uh, from what I observed or what I understood, it's not as cut and dry as um, the evolution model that we're familiar with, where, you know, we were apes one day and then all of a sudden we ate some meat and now we're humans. It's not that cut and dry. There were a lot of things involved. There was a lot of um, influence from other intelligent life that created our um, species today. Do you think that all life was brought here from other planets? That's a really good question, because then it means, do we have 
other species collectively being housed here. What I what I do know is that we are like a seed bank. Are you familiar with the seed bank in um, Antarctica? Right. Yeah. So we're Earth is kind of like that. We have here is housed a lot of different species, a lot of life forms that represent life forms out there, basically. Now you study genetics, right? Mm-hmm. And I would assume there are going to be some people in your circles that would say, well, human DNA is 85% the same as ape DNA or whatever those numbers are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How would you refute that? I wouldn't refute that because that's what I was shown. And that's one of the messages that I got is that we're connected more than we realize, not just spiritually, but the DNA is um, is connected. For example, there's a particular worm that lives in the ocean um, that's, uh, you know, as sturdy as a tardigrade, which are very sturdy mm -hmm. um, species, okay, that um, are able to tolerate really harsh environments. And they, um, those particular worms that live close to the, um, the hostile volcanic environment um, in the ocean, um, believe have about 88% DNA with us. Now, how could that be possible? They're completely different, but they share 88% DNA. That means that we came from the same place. We came from, you know, we're not necessarily the same. So apes are not necessarily us, but we came from the same place. You're saying we're from the same place. What place yeah. is that? Well, when I say place, I mean multiple, like um, it's a, a variety of, um, of uh, other life forms, basically. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we are apes. Right. It means that, yes, we're similar as we are similar to mushrooms, as we are similar to just, and I'm talking about scientifically similar. It brings the question then that, is all life sharing a majority of the same DNA? Yeah, that's a really good question. I don't know the answer because I don't know all life. But what I was shown was that we are definitely connected. Um, all life is connected, interconnected with each other. And we are interconnected with each other. So, um, but yeah, essentially so. Did they tell you why we were seated here? No. Mm -mm. No, but what I got was that it was in general that we're, this is a, for the soul, from the soul's perspective, um, are you familiar with like some of those type of uh, um, boot camp type of, you know, there are certain shows where you have to go through these, you know, obstacle courses or overcome certain challenge or whatever. And so it's kind of like that where this is a, a good place for the soul to evolve because there are challenges that we don't remember in our natural state that we have to kind of refine through our soul so that we can transform again. Did you learn if we have to keep coming back or do we choose to keep coming back? We definitely choose to keep coming back. So I am so mad at myself. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But mm -hmm. yeah, we choose to keep coming back. <laughs> is there an end point? Like yes, there is an end point. Um, whatever, there's no particular marker for that end point. It just depends on what your soul is supposed to learn um, in your state of knowing, in your state of being awakened, um, in your state when you, before you come here and you know what you need to refine. Once you've gone through the life that you will finally help your soul to overcome that very last lesson or whatever it is, then there is an end point to that. And then once we have that end point, we become one again with the stars. We are like stars. I mean, when, that saying that says we are stardust, no, we are literally stardust. So we, we become celestial. 
Did they share with you any events in the future that you've seen come to pass? Yes. Um, there's one I choose not to talk about just because, but I will tell you it's a very hot topic right now, especially recently in regards to a certain person mm. that recently had some, you know, um, recently a judgment was put against them. Okay. I think I can yeah. figure that out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so there were some things that came true in regards to that. Um, there were also uh, some things that uh, came true in regards to um, uh, a particular leader of an Asian country that I also won't mention that um, they had some particular event where they kind of softened up their approach for a little while with um, politics and a, a lot of different things, but then reverted back to who they were. Um, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, so some of the things I've seen, but when I came, when I came back, I didn't know that those were things that were prophetic. I was just thinking, well, why, you know, I, cause I couldn't remember necessarily, um, <clears throat> what I asked to be shown. I was just shown stuff. So I, it was hard to connect the dots. Um, when I saw Jesus, for example, I believe that that was that final weekend, I think probably the third time that I was about to crash. And what happened was that a silver sphere appeared. When I came, you know, when I woke up, I was, you know, throughout the time where I was just trying to recover and everything, it was just bothering me about why did I see the silver sphere? And then Jesus appeared. And then there was this light that panned around. And I made a tunnel um, shape and I was very calm. And so I, you know, had questions as to whether or not that silver sphere meant anything. So I was looking it up online. I was researching. I couldn't find anything about the silver sphere except for um, something that was kind of obscure from a long time ago. And um, when I meditated about it, I got that it was a transportation device. And so um, when, when we started having these silver spheres show up, then I started thinking it, maybe there was a connection. I'm still not completely sure, you know, um, so I can't speak on, oh, yes, for sure. This means that or you know, the other, but it, it, it was exactly as it appeared in my NDE and it's my soul and my meditation tells me it's meaningful and it has to do with transportation. And since I went to another planet in my um, NDE, I mean, I traveled celestially. Before I got to this planet, I saw um, um, Nebula and I was in like kind of a, um, kind of like a the same type of uh the same type of look where my eyes I, I didn't see my body all I saw was just out um so I was just traveling I was peaceful I loved space it was very nice came to this planet I saw these people just or uh, I'm calling them people in my human words of course just going about their day and there were species that were, their skin was like, um, it was like whitish, but it was like translucent a little bit. And it would have, um, they each had different colors that was reflecting their aura. So I don't know if that it was, if their auras were different because of feelings or if it meant something or if it was like a family heredity thing or whatever but they had different um they had different colors and they were vibrant colors they weren't our standard neutral tones and i was just observing them you know for a while and then before i was pulled back away from them so i thought maybe you know transportation device this i don't know i you know what i'm saying i was just kind of 
you know, after the fact, going back and trying to figure out what happened. <laughs> How did Jesus present himself to you? Well, Jesus was a light in the shape of, I could see that it was Jesus, but my guide said, this is Jesus's spirit with you. Um, so Jesus was not like the color of a black man or a white man or a Middle Eastern man. Um, the Jesus I saw was light and it was the shape of Jesus, basically. I, and I was told this was Jesus's spirit. So when you traveled to the nebula and the other planet, were you with a guide or did you go by yourself? I heard a guide there. So, and was telling me to kind of look and observe and things like that, but I wasn't by myself completely. I was with a, you know, um, this, the guides that were with me, um, other than the one that looked like my daughter, which I could visibly see, the others were auditory. Were they male or female voices? One of each. One was a female and one was a male. Do you think you have any idea who these guides were? Mm hmm Yeah. Um, before all of this, I meditated, um, you know, often, and I would, you know, um, like, for example, my grandmother died, mm -hmm. and I could have sworn that I heard my grandmother, you know. Um, I feel as though they were family, and that they were... Um, individuals that I didn't know, but knew me because they felt like family, basically, maybe an ancestor or something like that. You mentioned that you were pulled back from the planet. Do you mm -hmm. think you were attached by some kind of silver cord or maybe like magnetically pulled back? I was magnet magnetically pulled back because my daughter, as I said, was my anchor. And um, basically, that was the last memory that I had before I woke up. So, and on the outside, what was happening, according to my family, was that I was told that, um, or they were told that, um, you know, of course, I was going to pass within a few hours, people coming, they uh, asked to take me off of life support. And then the, um, the, um, when my parents said, you know, no, just try something else. They switched me to an oscillator and oscillators are not really used much anymore. And so they brought it up, um, and they, um, you know, out of, you know, commission or whatever. And, um, they had to bring somebody in to, who knew how to use it. And they, which is more gentle on the lungs because with a ventilator, you're violently going up and down a lot. And so um, it was more gentle on my lungs. I'd gotten 50% better. And then after, after that, I perpetually got better till I woke up. What I'm experiencing during that time on the other side is I went to my oxygen, my CO2 level was over 200. I'm traveling to space. I'm seeing all of this, um, you know, this planet, experiencing these things. And the um, after that point where I passed where I would have crashed, I'm just awake, you know, I and that's it. And that's all I, you know, that's all I experienced. But I didn't, there between the two points, I was just in space, and then I was awake. Once you returned to a fully awakened conscious state, did you remember mm -hmm. all that stuff immediately or did it take a while for those memories to come back? Well, honestly, I, that's a really good question. And honestly, it freaked me out because I remembered everything. So I was thinking to myself, why am I being... You know, why am I remembering everything? Why am I, why is God allowing me to remember that? Um, I have bad short-term memory with other things, but when I came back, I was crystal clear 
I felt more intelligent. My wounds were healing quickly. So I knew I had a real experience. But, you know, even though I'm spiritual, I'm also scientific. So I was like, I was analyzing and overanalyzing and, you know, and analyzing a lot and trying to think to myself, is this a real experience? And, um, you know, I deemed it was real. My trach my tracheotomy closed up in a day to the point where even my doctor was shocked and just kind of, you know, I had nurses coming in and saying, oh my gosh, you know, this was a miracle. And there were, there were evidences, you know, that a real experience took place and it was miraculous. But in the same respect, why did I remember everything so clearly? And why was I so sharp? They literally thought I was going to be in a vegetated state. After you were back, were you mm -hmm. depressed or angry that you were back? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the things that happened, the human things that happened, was I had some PTSD. I was really irritated by a lot of things in the world. I didn't care as much about a lot of things that I cared about before. The only thing I really cared about was my daughter. But even though we were so connected, while I was going through this, she was traumatized. So we had to work through that connection and work through our trauma of what we experienced with each other in two different states. And um, I basically, I, w I was, you know, I started to get depressed because I just, I felt a little hopeless. I was glad that I was shown all of these different things because it gave me understanding and perspective, but I also felt hopeless. Like, what can I do? You know, I felt like I'm just one person who cares, <laughs> you know, and um, yeah, so I did, I did feel that for a little while. Do you feel like you have a mission now? You know, a lot of people think, you know, a lot of people ask me that, do you feel a purpose, a mission? And honestly, when I first came back, I was just kind of like reeling from it all and really just kind of like, whoa, uh, I, I spent more time kind of analyzing and dissecting everything that I saw than feeling like I had a particular mission. This happened in 2015. And I only recently started talking about it because it took me that long to process it. You know, it's a lot to process. And, you know, my first priority was my daughter and helping her to process her thoughts and trauma and everything else. So I put a little part of myself to the side. But after this time, I still remember things clearly. And I do feel like there's a reason I remember and I do know that I was being nagged by a divine source, not nagged in a human nag, but um, encouraged is more like it to, to share. And I just wasn't ready to, I just, you know what I'm saying? I was kind of focused on the real world mm -hmm. and real issues. So um, now I feel like I need to share about it because now I feel like it's time, not because, not just because of my time, but because the world, it's the world's time now to hear more types of stories like this, because our world is shifting um, to a different place. Like I said before, what I was, um, what I was, uh, um, the information that I was given was that we are in a dystopia and we're moving out of a dystopia depending on our actions. Do you have any time frame, like when this will be completed? I believe within 20 years, it will be completed. Within five and seven years, we're going to have a big shift. Uh, within April, I feel as though there's something that may happen, something big that may happen in April that um, kind of gives us a sense of that connectivity. Um, but the biggest, the, the main timelines that keep popping out to me, even when I meditate now and everything is this April, definitely this year, we're going to have a major contact event. And then in five to seven years, there's going to be something that's going to happen. 
And then after that, it's going to be just kind of lots of transitions until we kind of, you know, sink or swim, basically. We kind of settle in a particular place that will hopefully be a more enlightened place. So are you, when you say a contact event, that means with extraterrestrials mm -hmm. this month? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if it's this month. I feel like it could be this month, but there are a lot of things that go back and forth and in play. Um, you know, a lot of people who have had NDEs, they, um, you know, they say that now their psychic abilities are, you know, in, um, heightened. All of us have psychic awareness. We just have it to various different degrees. But even with psychic awareness, you're usually, um, there's only 85% percent accuracy because our timelines are always shifting depending on different outcomes and different things that happen so that being said i believe something major is going to happen in april um and it could have to do with some type of um uh alien event or something else but definitely this year in 2023 we're going to have a major contact event do you have any idea what that event would be like? No, I don't. So um, anybody who sees things, regardless of whether they've had an NDE or not, you're only allowed to see certain things. I've seen other people talk about how they try to astrally travel and they get sent back by something. So all of us have permission to see and not to see, you know, because we're human, you know? So I don't know what that event is going to look like. What I do believe is that um, uh, extraterrestrials, when we have contact with them, a major event, I'm more inclined to believe it's benevolent based on what I saw, and it's not some type of attack, okay? Um, I don't believe, um, from, from the information that I got, I don't, think that things like Project Blue Book is going to work. I mean, there are too many people that are aware of that, that it's, you know, it's not going to happen. Um, so I believe that if extraterrestrials wanted to kill us off, they had more than enough time to do so up until now. And there's no reason for that to happen now. Um, we just had to kind of be at a place where so many strange things were happening that we were more open to strange things. So this is going to be an event. It's going to be obvious for everyone. Exactly. So basically, when I say contact event, major contact event, there's been already a lot of contact events. Mm -hmm. You know, there are lots of logical, intelligent people that see, you know, um, evidence of other life in other planets all the time but this is going to be undeniable this is going to be okay we're ready to you know we're ready to accept and move forward from would you say it's going to be unconcealable unconcealable mm -hmm. let's see like if there's some kind of major sporting event now I would, you know, like, <laughs> we've already passed the super bowl so you if we, we'd say a ufo flies over the super bowl so we all see it or you know something right. like that I, don't I know. think that they're going to eclipse Rihanna. So, yes. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think the ETs control our reincarnation process? No. Mm -mm. From the information I got, is that there is one God, one divine spirit who is creator of all different types of life forms. We think that our God just created us and the animals and plants that live here. God has created lots of different species in other planets, but they're not our, they're not our gods. We are an extension of God and we are also have a symbiotic relationship with God. And we are like gods ourselves in a way, you know, um, kind of the way that our children are, are our mini me's, you know, they get some of our DNA, they get some of our traits they get even some of our um, sociological and, you know, psychological and, you know, emotional things. And they can create, <clears throat> excuse me, they can create their own, you know, reality as well. 
So then why are the ETs coming here? For benev- I believe it's for benevolent purposes. Now, there are ETs, for, um, from what I understand, there are ETs that are not, but that's like humans. There's some people that are bad, and there's some people that are good. And there's some, you know, it's the same thing with the ETs, but the ones that, um, the ones that are coming are going to, um, to help us. They, and it's not their first time. They've been here before, you know, ancient times. They've been here. Do you think they're here to help us move out of this dystopian life? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Help to enlighten us. Ultimately, we can only enlighten ourselves because the same metaphor exists in our life right now where nobody can help you if you can't, if you don't help yourself. So it's the same thing that exists with them. They can help us, but if we don't help ourselves, then it's kind of moot. Was the other side more real than here or dreamlike? The other side felt more real um, because... uh, it was more real, but it had more superpowers. You know what I mean? So like here, I could say, con- you know, say I want to kinetically move something across the room, but I can't do that. I'm just a human. I can't do stuff like that. Even though we actually really can, we just haven't tapped into that. Mm-hmm. Over there, it was, I can do that. And it was completely normal. Did you get any superpowers or at least some new abilities from the NDE? I feel like my IQ went up. <laughs> um, I definitely became more intuitive um, since the NDE. I, you know, I'm not a person who like, uh, you know, goes and gives people readings and things like that or whatever, other than if my family or friends ask me about something. But I've had more psychic ability increase of things that be, um, that were true. If a friend would ask me, hey, do you think this is, you know, whatever, I can, it's h- kind of hard to explain, but I, there's a psychic awareness of a yes, a no, or this is going to happen, or that's going to happen that's a lot stronger. In what other ways has your life changed since the experience? I feel as though my life is more directed around my NDE. Mm -hmm. Um, Looking back, I see there were ways that I wasn't completely embracing it before, you know, Mm -hmm. just because I saw some things that were really odd. And when I'd seen other people talk about their, you know, NDEs, like on a TV show or something like that, everybody had the robes and the you know, the white robes and being on a cloud or something like that. And mine was so odd. I was just kind of like, you know, wanted to process that and, you know, see if it was my real experience until I started learning that other people had this type of experience too, where they went to space. It's yet to be understood why some people go outer space and uh, I also, you know, I travel dimensions as well. And some people have that kind of traditional NDE, but it's either, it may be for us to know and it may be not for us to know. I feel that some of the NDEs may be based on the condition of the body. Mm, Like in how bad of shape the body is. Like if the person's clinically dead, then they Mm -hmm. may be more free to to travel further out like you did. Mm-hmm. I don't know that's, if you, that's a really interesting thought. I hadn't thought about that. I don't know if you ever were clinically dead or not, were you? No, I don't think I ever fully crashed. I it, was told that my um my CO2 went up to like 200 and something. My um all of my organs had failed and that um my uh blood pressure was extremely low like i was literally on the edge (laughs) literally on the edge maybe your oxygen level dropped to a point low enough where you had more of a disconnect well that's why i believe that i was able to travel in and out of the body was because 
my consciousness detached from my body because my body was um, struggling. And I was kind of in a place where I could stay or I could go, you know. So and during that, I was having an experience trying to help me to decide and also help me to fight to, you know, find a reason, I should say, to stay. And um, I had wondered for myself when I was analyzing this, if when my CO2 was so high, if that was when my space travel, that when I visited that planet, because I was trying to think, okay, how could somebody survive that without coming back with the inability to speak, to write, everything else? You know, it's mind blowing. It's like sitting in a garage, breathing nothing but CO2 and, you know, for hours and coming out fine instead of dying. Did the guides ever give you a message for humanity? No. Mm -mm. This was more for me and my understanding. I asked, you know, to see a lot of different things. And um, I asked a lot of questions, you know, and I was shown a lot of different things. So I don't believe that, and then this is my own personal belief. Others might feel differently. I don't believe that the way that God operates is that there's one person that comes back with a message for humanity. Everybody has messages. And some of those messages show up at the bus stop or they show up at, you know, you know, places that you that you visit. So when somebody has an experience like mine, they have a lot of messages that they can share that other people can can you know get something from but it doesn't necessarily mean you know a message for humanity there's a part, two parts of that that message has to be received that message has to be embraced so regardless of what anybody says if somebody doesn't embrace it then it doesn't have any type of effect or do anything have you been having any more out of body experiences since you've been back no, I was actually told um, that I cannot astrally travel and I don't even attempt to. It's like I don't have, <clears throat> from my experience, there's kind of like a boundary now, like I can't do it, like by initiating it myself, you know, like I'm not allowed to, I guess, mm -hmm. in a way. Has the experience affected your dreams in any way? No. It hasn't actually. The only thing that it's a um, that happens is is that I do receive, you know, images and messages um, through dream experience. But those are in my usually my own personal life. Anytime I um, have some type of awareness of something else, it's usually when I'm meditating. So, mm -hmm. but have, I have regular dreams. Have you told your friends and family about this? And if so, not all of them, what's been the reactions of the ones you have? They're just in awe, you know, they're just, you know, they're very, you know, they're trying to wrap their head around it as well. And some of them were there, you know, and saw me in my worst state. Some of them were told, um, you know, two, three times that they better come and say goodbye, you know? So they're just kind of trying to wrap their heads around it. Um, and I have, you know, in my, I'm surrounded by people who are very religious, people who are metaphysical and people who, um, and one person who is atheist and, you know, so there's a varying degree. And what I was, the information I was given in my NDE was that everybody's going to respond differently. It's not my place to tell people what to do necessarily, or tell people what to believe or what to accept, because everybody's on a journey. And we have to give people permission to kind of evolve and accept what they want to when they're ready, because it's their journey, you know? It's for their soul. So we have to respect that. So for example, 
my um, the one person who was atheist still is atheist, but like, you know, I can't argue with them and say that's just their experience. And I think that's one of the things that was different when I came back was that I started to realize that nothing mattered that much and that everybody's having an experience and is on a journey and needs they need to have the space and permission to do that. Like we're, we don't need to assert our authority on other people with our opinions. We can share, you know, our little message for humanity, but if they want to accept it, fine. If they don't, you know, don't get offended. <laughs> so. <laughs> While you were in the coma, was there any point that you saw friends or family members and then later when you woke up, you told those people, yeah, I was in a coma and I was outside your body yes. and you were doing this? Yes. Mm-hmm. How did there they, was. How did they uh, respond? Surprise. <laughs> like trying to process it because even, um, you know, it's, I, I always say that I feel like by my experience, some of the people around me might have been more traumatized than I was, you know, because they went through the drama. I was just living another reality and in another place and visiting other places, you know, and being other things. So you weren't experiencing any pain or were under any no. duress? Mm -mm. I didn't feel any pain, you know. I didn't know how badly I'd gotten. What inspires you about your experience? Well, besides my, how my daughter handled it, that's one big inspiration. The other thing is just how amazing God is. Some people call God the creator, the universe. God has many names, um, but there's only one source of energy. And I'm just amazed at how this happened. And I'm still here. After watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you mm -hmm. up for that? Sure. Mm -hmm. How can they reach you? You can email me at less than 1% 1111 at gmail.com. And my social media, Twitter which I'm still deciding on whether I'm not going to keep it or not, but it's URL 1111. It's my Twitter. Okay. Before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Everything is going to be okay. Right now, everybody needs to focus on their health, getting healthier because the body and the mind needs to be able to handle a lot of the stress of some of these transitions, but in the end, everything is going to be okay. L, thank you for that message. And thank you for being my guest. Thank you for having me. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.